I'm eating grass. And someone's eating me. I don't like it. <laughs> Today, we'll take a look at the animals from the bottom of the food chain who decided they didn't like the way things are. Let's go. Snakes are the natural predators of rabbits, just as rabbits are the natural prey of snakes. But everything can change if the snake picks the wrong prey. Like a mother willing to do anything to protect her babies. As soon as the female eastern cottontail discovered that her offspring was about to be devoured by the black rat snake, it seemed like she's forgotten who the actual predator was. The rabbit charged at the snake. She didn't just pounce on the snake to scare it away, she bit it with her teeth. The snake tried to crawl away, but the angry mother rabbit wouldn't have it. She pulled the snake back several times, biting, rolling on her back, trying to disembowel the predator. Actually, rabbits have quite strong teeth. It's actually strange why they don't use them as weapons. And although the black rat snake managed to kill two of the three baby rabbits, the mother's goal was to once and for all discourage the predator from returning to her nest. I think she did a good job. I wouldn't be surprised if the snake developed a phobia of rabbits after this. While the mother rabbit almost tore the snake apart, the hare fought the Western Marsh Harrier. That's a bird from the hawk family. It's not very large, but formidable enough to be a deadly predator for hares. When hares see this bird, they quickly hide or run away, but not this one. He was jumping up and down like he was going to grab the Marsh Harrier and kick him hard. Perhaps this was also a female who protected the offspring, hidden somewhere in the grass. Motherhood does amazing things to animals. By the way, since we got examples of infuriated animals that are supposed to be the prey, we should understand how much of a fight they could put up. Let's look at rabbits. After all, hares seem more formidable to me. According to the researchers, rabbits can be quite fierce if they want to. They might seem soft and fluffy at first glance. Rabbits use their sharp teeth and claws to attack each other and can easily scratch or bite until they bleed. That's what they do to each other. Can you imagine what they'll do if locked in a fight against a predator? Also, rabbits have really strong legs, which could kick hard. And then I thought that some ungulates could probably kick the predator even harder. But when Steve and I started looking for information, we stumbled upon a completely different story. A herd of zebras was crossing a river in the Masai Mara National Reserve when they were attacked by crocodiles. Usually, this ends with zebras dying, and it's sort of a natural order of things. However, it turned out that supposedly helpless herbivores have a weapon strong enough to fight back. This weapon is their teeth. Yes, the zebra literally bit the crocodile that was about to bite it and sank its teeth right into the crocodile's throat. If I were a predator, I wouldn't expect this at all. I mean, imagine your cheeseburger suddenly trying to eat you. Naturally, you'll throw it away. So the crocodile released the zebra, and it calmly crossed to the other side of the river. And I can imagine the rest of the zebras are like, hold on, we could do that? However, zebras have a mighty kick too. Check out these photos taken in 2011 at the Ngorongoro Conservation Area in Tanzania. Zebras were calmly strolling through the grass, unaware of a lion lying in an ambush. However, when he attacked from behind, and this is how lions usually hunt, a zebra began to jump and kick so furiously, it not only shook the predator off, but also gave him a good kick to the face. Honestly, this looks painful. Moreover, zebras are capable of doing extremely powerful kicks. Scientists say that zebras have strong hindquarters that can strike with enough force to break a crocodile's jaw. Zebras are generally considered to have the strongest kick and have been known to kill a 617-pound male African lion with a single body kick, if of course they're angry enough or scared enough to hit the right spot. In general, when fighting a zebra which doesn't want to become a lion's dinner, the predator will be very lucky if he comes out of this fight alive. Remember how in one of the previous videos we already mentioned donkeys that can guard other animals? Of course, that's hardly because they're related to zebras, but I simply have to talk about them again. Here's the most striking example for you. Not so long ago, in April 2022, guard donkeys were dispatched to Colorado to protect a herd of cows from wolves. The reason was simple. At some point, attacks by wolves became more frequent. Something had to be done about it. And in addition to other methods of protection, 
they decided to use wild donkeys. And since these animals are very sociable, plus they're used to constantly protecting themselves and their herd from predators in the wild, they can handle the job on par with dogs. Once again, their job is not to run away from predators, but to fend them off the best they can. Plus, these cute ungulates are cheaper than dogs and don't require any additional training. The donkeys just need to, well, be donkeys. However, I have to say that each link on the food chain is closely connected to the others. You could be a snake that eats mice and rabbits and then become a meal for some hawk. For example, a red-tailed hawk noticed a western rat snake and thought that the snake was the perfect prey. Big, delicious, nutritious, but he didn't take into account that the snake was quite big, which means that it was strong enough to fight back. Any misplaced grab by the bird in which the talons don't end up in the body of the snake means that the snake gets multiple loops around the bird to constrict it, like holding the bird in a vise. Such cases aren't uncommon, and sometimes the loops the snake forms with its body squeeze the bird's throat. Actually, from what Steve and I have been able to find, people usually intervene in situations like this. They separate the opponents, which rush to hide. But if not for people, the snakes would have killed quite many birds that chose the wrong dinner. Basically, snakes use their strong muscles to their advantage in order to survive. But this is what almost all animals do. Meanwhile, kangaroos themselves create a situation where they have an upper hand. To protect itself from the dog, the kangaroo got into the water because it understands very well how water works. A kangaroo can stand waist deep in water, but it can still punch with its front arms. All a dog can do is swim closer and, well, that's it. It can't even bite a kangaroo because it'll immediately get punched with powerful front arms. And here's another story, also involving a kangaroo, a dog, and water. I'm starting to think that all kangaroos attend some kind of dog fighting course. But this time, the wild animal didn't just retreat into the water, it grabbed the enemy in the water and started drowning it. That is, dogs, of course, are great swimmers, but even they have a limit. When we studied the interaction of kangaroos and water a little, it turned out that they do have a certain instinct. Ecologists and kangaroo experts say these animals do rush into the water when threatened by a predator, and the dog is definitely considered a predator, even if the kangaroo is quite big. And yes, some kangaroos are strong enough to grab the dog with their powerful arms with no less powerful claws and drown it. They say that some Australians often lose their dogs due to kangaroos. But let's not blame the poor kangaroos. They don't benefit from these killings, so most likely they stay in the water hoping no one would chase them there. And yet, battles between kangaroos and dogs happen much less frequently than, for example, fights between octopuses and seabirds, mainly because neither the kangaroo nor the dog is particularly interested in killing each other. Meanwhile, seabirds will be very happy if the octopus dies because it'll become their delicious dinner then. Although octopuses can hide and disguise themselves, birds still find them sometimes. And that's when everything becomes much more interesting. So the seabird has excellent eyesight, sharp claws, and a beak. The octopus has eight muscular, flexible tentacles with their own brains each, plus suckers. And of course, a beak, which could inflict a really painful bite as it has toxic substances. A bird sees an octopus and thinks it can catch it for a snack. It takes a dive. But as soon as the bird touches the water, the octopus comes out and grabs its opponent, pulling it closer. Hundreds of suckers prevent the bird from escaping, by the way, each sucker of a giant octopus could hold up to 35 pounds, let alone some poor seagull. Of course, the bird will fight back, peck furiously, and scratch the tentacles, but even if the octopus loses a couple of them, he won't be too upset because he can always grow them back. However, the outcome of the battle will depend on the size of the enemy. If a bird chooses to pick a fight with a giant octopus, which can weigh up to 220 pounds, then it won't have a single chance. If the octopus is smaller than that, then it won't drown the bird, although it will still have the opportunity to fight back, but only if it can put the weapon given by nature to good use. To be honest, I somehow can't imagine octopuses as prey. They seem to be strong enough to be formidable predators, and any encounters with seagulls are simply a mistake on the part of the birds. It's different when it comes to rats and snakes. It's usually immediately clear who's the aggressor here. 
Though rats can go berserk and activate their rage mode when it comes to protecting their offspring, in Naples, a mother rat charged at a predator who was trying to take away her pup. It's not entirely clear what kind of snake it was, most likely non-venomous, but I don't think the rat would have given up anyway. She kept biting and grabbing the snake until it released the baby rat. Fortunately, it was alive. It's an understandable desire to protect their young, characteristic of many animal species. It has nothing to do with having tender feelings towards babies, although perhaps they do exist. But each animal seeks to spread its genes as much as possible, puts in time and effort into reproduction only for some kind of snake to undo all the work? No way! Moreover, rats do have something to fight snakes with. Actually, they can be quite ferocious, hunt and kill on their own, and if necessary, use their weapons for self-defense. I'm talking about rat teeth. Back in 1812, the German mineralogist developed a scale to measure the ability of gemstones and minerals to scratch other materials. One being the softest mineral, 10 is the hardest. Everything simple. Rat teeth are ranked 5.5 on this scale, which means they're harder than copper and iron. Rats can easily chew through wood, brick, and in some cases even concrete and rusty metal. There's also more recent data. For example, not long ago, netizens complained that rats gnawed at their iron cookware. You know those metal pans and ladles that survived three of your great-grandmothers but were powerless against rat teeth? Well, of course, everything depends on the thickness and type of material. It's clear that the rats could hardly handle a huge cast-iron boiler, but the aluminum sheet is a piece of cake for them. The only question is, why are they even doing this? Take a bite of this. <laughs> no! 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 But since rats can fend off snakes, cats are simply helpless against them. Okay, so they might not be so helpless, but this is not like in Tom and Jerry, at least because Jerry was a mouse. And rats are too big and fearless for cats. Ever since humans have domesticated cats, or rather cats have chosen to live near us, we've been using these animals to control rodents. In general, for about nine millennia, cats have been helping people with this difficult task. But a few years ago, in New York, scientists tried to study rats and found that cats were actually bad at killing them. I'm serious. Just look at these figures. In five months, motion-triggered cameras captured only two successful kills, and it was in a place crawling with rats. There were at least 150 of them in there. Yes, the cameras captured another 20 stalking attempts and another failed attempt to kill a rat, and that's it. Cats are great at dealing with mice and young rats, but as soon as the rodents grow to a certain size, some kind of unvoiced agreement comes into force, and the rats and cats begin to simply ignore each other. Only very desperate, and most likely very hungry cats will dare to hunt an adult rat. Usually they just eat the same garbage and don't bother each other. By the way, when I say that rats are too big for cats, I mean it. New York brown rats typically weigh around 12 ounces. That is, about 10 times the weight of the average mouse. Now imagine you're a stray cat. You have a choice. Attack a mouse that weighs an ounce and is unlikely to fight back, a bird that weighs half an ounce and can fly away, or a giant, ferocious rat that can bite you so hard it'll hurt a lot. Not to mention the fact that you can lose an eye and even die from an infection. In short, I get why cats don't want to mess with rats. But we spoke enough about small predators. How about someone really formidable? The one whose position in the food chain is definitely not going to be challenged by anyone. A bear. Or even better, a grizzly bear. The most bloodthirsty, ferocious predator, and generally the villain of many children's cartoons about animals, when grizzly bears attack, they tend to focus on the victim's head, back of the neck, and shoulders. They attack from above. After all, they're tall enough for that. But sometimes they aren't lucky, and the prey turns into a killer. The body of a 154-pound female grizzly bear has been discovered by hikers near a popular hiking route. At first, the authorities were not sure what exactly caused the death. But a necropsy revealed a surprising culprit, a mountain goat. The locations of the wounds on the grizzly's neck and armpit suggest that the goat, being attacked by the bear, was able to pierce the bear with its horns. The goat probably jerked its head back hard or something. They say that mountain goats rarely survive bear attacks, though it can happen sometimes. After all, they're strong, heavy animals. Males can weigh up to 300 pounds, and nature gave them excellent means for self-defense. So if some predator attacks mountain goats, he must be ready for a tough fight. Not only bears, but also cougars are at risk. Well, just like anyone who's not fast enough to dodge the horns. 
But I was much more impressed by the story of a boar who managed to kill a bear. And not some wild boar, but a tame one. I must say right away, I found this story in a book, and it happened somewhere in the early 19th century. A bunch of hogs in Arkansas were attacked by a predator, and all the animals, except for the boar, rushed to seek protection from people. It didn't come up until two hours later. The animal was in such bad condition, wounded and covered in blood, not to mention its spirit. When you're a boar that just fought a bear, it's quite an unnerving situation. In short, the boar was still angry and very restless. When people followed the tracks of the wounded boar, they found the dead bear and evidence of a desperate struggle. Cane, weeds, and papaya bushes were mashed flat to the ground. The poor bear was mangled by the boar's tusks almost beyond description. It had deep gashes and lacerations all over its body and legs. The greatest wounds were inflicted on the belly of the bear. Apparently, the boar hit the bear with its tusks so hard that he had no chance of surviving. The further fate of the boar, however, is unknown. I hope he was fine. Actually, I think that when push comes to shove, any animal will fight to the end, showing resilience you'd never expect from it. It's strange that prey doesn't act like this all the time. Take for example penguins. Giant petrels are one of the predators they fear most. Although giant petrels forage most of the time as scavengers, they can be very aggressive hunters when they find suitable prey. Baby penguins or even injured adults are quite a suitable target. But sometimes things don't go according to the plan, and the whole colony of penguins attacks the giant petrel. Yes, this is a predator, but there are more penguins, and they're fiercer. We don't know how the giant petrel ended up on the ground and why he lost the ability to fly, but it's quite clear this was a big mistake on his part. The outcome is quite predictable. The penguins dealt with their enemy. And here you can see how the emperor penguin chicks are attacked by a petrel and try to huddle together to make it harder for the predator to choose a victim. Perhaps this would have worked, or maybe one of the penguins would be seriously injured, if not for the Adelie penguin. <laughs> I like how he confidently walks, as if he's about to tell the petrel that he flew into the wrong neighborhood. Maybe that's what the penguin actually told him, because soon the predator simply flew away in search of easier prey. That was the right decision. Although uh, Delhi penguins are small and funny looking, they're reckless, bold, and rarely fear animals they should be scared of. And when you're confronted by such a small but brave creature, you feel like it's better to stay away from it, just in case. Now tell me, who's going to win a fight between a California ground squirrel and a Pacific rattlesnake, given that both animals are healthy adults? If it was any other video, you'd probably bet on a rattlesnake. But today, we have a special case. When confronted by a rattlesnake, ground squirrels usually try to kick dirt and debris right into the snake's face and lunge at it to see how active it is. If it looks like the snake is dangerous, the ground squirrel forces blood to its tail by heating it up, then causes the fur on it to stand on end and starts waving it frantically. This usually baffles the snake. Not because the ground squirrel is acting weird, the snake perceives it as something very large and very warm standing in front of it. Most likely, it's also quite dangerous, so it's better not to attack this creature. But if the snake attacks anyway, the ground squirrels turn into ninjas. They pounce on the snake from different angles, slash at it with their sharp teeth, and drop on the snake's head with their whole body. And if this is a mother who protects her babies, Finish I don't envy the snake. But the most amazing little animal with a ruthless killer mode is the Bornean tufted ground squirrel. It's endemic to the island of Borneo, weighs several pounds, and it's damn malicious. According to local hunters, this cute fluffy animal attacks deer and kills them in order to eat the contents of their stomachs, livers, and hearts. The squirrel said to perch on low branches, ambushing passing deer and biting them on the jugular veins to make the animal bleed to death. As soon as the deer dies, the squirrel eats its internal organs. Let me remind you, we're still talking about the squirrel. Yeah, this one, with a cute tail and ears. In villages close to the edge of the forest, there were also reports of the squirrel killing domestic chickens and eating only the heart and liver. Although this may seem like a fabrication, naturalist Edward Banks recorded in 1949 that the squirrel was wary, 
difficult to observe and biting fiercely. In addition, other types of squirrels actively hunt small vertebrates. So why can't these animals include deer in their menu? After all, their sharp teeth and claws make it quite possible. <sighs> okay. In 2020, they did some research and found that Bornean tufted ground squirrels basically eat two kinds of seeds. But who knows, maybe in the future we'll learn more facts and suddenly realize that somewhere on our planet, they're actually cute, fluffy deer killers. Everything is more or less clear with wasps. You don't expect them to be peaceful. They're ready to sting and do what it takes to protect their offspring. But when you think about wasps versus birds, you still bet on birds. But wasps can also go berserk. This insect has been seen landing on the head of a four-day-old chick in Brazil while the parents were away, biting it, tearing its flesh, leaving the poor chick mortally wounded. Other chicks in the same area had similar injuries. I mean, it wasn't an accident. Generally, wasps don't mind eating meat, but they usually prefer meat that won't fight back. That is, carrion. On the other hand, when there's a defenseless chick around that looks like a good snack, why not attack it? According to observations, one wasp made 17 visits to the bird's nest within about an hour and 40 minutes. It may have needed several trips to carry the pieces of the bird to its own nest. And if you think this is somehow cruel to birds, then... Well, this is life in the wild. It's actually quite harsh. There are birds that eat bees and wasps, literally knocking the sting out of them. So that's hardly surprising the insects are holding a grudge. They're actually lucky, as they didn't have to deal with a bird called the Vampire Finch. Sounds like the name of a goofy Halloween party costume. But it's an actual species that lives in the Galapagos Archipelago. At first glance, this is a small, harmless bird with a very, very sharp beak, which it uses to eat not only fruits and nuts. The vampire finch gets its name from its bizarre habit of pecking at the skin of large birds and feeding on their blood. Apparently, this happens when other food sources are scarce. In the Galapagos Archipelago, food can be an issue. The main prey of these feathered bloodsuckers are Nazca and blue-footed boobies and they don't really mind when their necks are pecked. Although no one knows exactly how vampire finches developed a taste for blood in the first place, it's believed that over the centuries they sometimes peck too hard at the skin of seabirds while feeding on their parasites, so they pecked too hard a couple times and then they started enjoying it. Happens to all of us. See you later.